The man wailed, body shaking with each sob as he rocked back and forth on the curb. He held his head, fingers digging into his blonde hair, as if clawing at the horrors that unfolded in his mind. His eyes were closed tightly, refusing to see more. He fell silent for a moment, then looked up at the red minivan that lay on its roof in the middle of the road, a macabre vessel amid a sea of broken glass. There was a beat, and reality hit him. No, 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 he screamed, as the truth forced itself inside his guarded mind, projecting the images once more. We caught each other's eyes for a moment as I hurriedly carried the extrication tools to the side of the vehicle. He howled at the sight of the jaws of life, sending him into a higher wave of torment. The van was eerily still, a stark contrast to the devastating impact that it had endured moments earlier. Jagged metal pushed deep into the space where a mother and a child sat, a concave imprint of another vehicle stamped into the frame. A woman's slender arm hung limply from beneath the white side impact airbags, as if draped by a mortician. A stuffed panda lay in a puddle of coolant and petrol, button eyes staring as if traumatized from what it had just witnessed. The emergency lights illuminated its reflection in the fluid, apparent horror magnified with every strobe. What had happened in the moment before the impact? I thought of my son, sleeping peacefully after a day at the beach, clutching his sock monkey without a care in the world. Was this child sleeping, dreaming, before the collision tore her favorite toy from her hands? I shook the thought from my mind, focusing on the task at hand. Welcome to Glorious Professionals, brought to you by GoRuck Media. I'm Jason here with Rich. Our guest today in the Champagne Room is James Gearing, firefighter, paramedic, author of One More Light, and host of Behind the Shield podcast. I've met a lot of firefighters in my life, we, we both have, but James is the first one to come on Glorious Professionals. We've just uh, enjoyed some Florida sunshine out there on the beach, and it's an honor to have you here. Thanks for coming. Well, thank you so much. I'm honored to, uh, to sit here and honored to have you in reading the book too, so I appreciate it. I got goosebumps while I was reading that again. I did too. <laughs> it's, um, look, there's just something raw emotion there. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But I think, I think anyone in the first responder professions has seen a version of that and it's, and it's heartbreaking. Yeah. So we're going to get to some more of that, but what, what we like to start with is we want to understand how you became a person dedicated to, to this level of service. So grew up on a farm in England. Tell us about that early mentors. W what was it like? So I was very lucky. Um, I think that's one of the reasons why I felt like it was my duty to serve because I had a, a great childhood. My dad was a vet um, specialized in horses. So I grew up literally lambing sheep and, you know, some of my best memories are stopping mid-surgery and having cheese sandwiches with him while the horse's guts are opened up all over the place. And um, so, yeah, I mean, it was, it was amazing. And I, I really also got to see that there were two types of people in the world because we had people walk through our doors from literally extended royal family through to gypsies, travelers. And that's not a, a vertical scale, it's a horizontal scale. But I saw that, you know, my parents treated everyone the same as long as they weren't bad people, you know. So that was kind of the, the upbringing I had. I'm one of five kids as well. So when people talk about, you know, come home when the streetlights came on, I mean, we just came home when it was dinner time, basically, whether it was light or, or not. So yeah, I mean, that, that was, I think the first introduction to service and obviously the, the service was for the people. And I know you're a, a dog lover and it's a big part of your story. Um, but you know, just serving animals with just that kindness and compassion. But what's interesting is I had wanted to be a firefighter when I was little. We had a couple of fires on the farm and, uh, you know, I had huge admir admiration for the men and women that showed up for those. As you saw in the book, I was in a fire when I was four, a house fire that my eight-year-old sister heroically got us out of, and I don't know how the hell she did. But the English system, when we're in schools, we have these medicals, and they do all these different tests, and one of them is a color test, color vision test, and they told me I was colorblind, and I could never be a firefighter, never be a pilot. So everything that was cool was taken off the table. So that was kind of the early early childhood as far as, um, you know, my yearning to serve. Um, and I found myself ultimately lifeguarding for, for a while. And then to kind of leading through, 
very long story short, I ended up in Japan working as a stuntman. I did stunts um, and moved to the U.S. after marrying an American girl. Had an epiphany at 25, 26 that I wasn't colorblind. It took me that long to figure out. <laughs> <laughs> to figure it out, not the uh, most intelligent of men. Um, but then once I was empowered and I challenged the very first medical and said, well, just tell me something to in the room to name the color of and I'll tell you. And that's that's basically what happened. So that was kind of what took me on the on the path to firefighting in the U.S. So father, mother, siblings, what, I mean, I understand your, your dad served. What was it like though? Like, what was it like at, at home from a you know, they treated others and that's, that's cool. You guys were out just roaming. Awesome. Right. You know, come back whenever, you know, was there, was there more though? Was there more kind of influence or mentorship or anything like that at an early, early age? I would, I would travel with my dad and go on his house calls. So again, I got to witness a lot of the healing. Um, but I think because we were left to our own devices, I was always a very, very small child. My son now is, you know, one of the smallest in his school year as well. His gearing's a late bloomers. Um, <laughs> but uh, honestly, I think it was the martial arts that really put other mentor figures into my life. And kind of, I think a lot of us suffer imposter syndrome. Like we think everyone else is born to do this job and we're just, you know, too small, too weak, whatever. So I think once I started doing that and then started winning some of these tournaments, I was like, oh, okay, well, maybe, maybe I am able to do that. So, but because again, I've been dissuaded from the profession, I didn't know anyone that was a firefighter. I didn't know anyone that was in the military. Um, I found out much later that my great uncle was actually the, the head of the London Fire Brigade during World War One, uh, World War Two. So during the Blitz, so there was a fire connection, but it was completely disconnected. So. I didn't really have that kind of mentorship aside from, you know, a couple of teachers that I really liked in school. And then probably the martial arts instructors were the ones that really kind of made me realize I was capable of doing manly man stuff. So how did they do that? Well, I mean, just the same as, as your background. I mean, I think a big part of it is just discipline and hard work. You, nothing's given. Well, I, I take that back. In, in some martial arts schools, you can get your black belt in the mail, but, um, you know, a, a good martial arts school you know, you, you work very hard and, and it's what I like about that belt system is you start white and you, you know, it takes a lot of work to work your way up. And then obviously you have the proving ground, which is the tournaments, you know, and that is a very harsh look at if you put the work in, you know, you can kind of sandbag on a, on a soccer team or a baseball team and kind of just hide in the corner and probably get away with it. But when you're standing against a guy that wants to knock you out, you just, you know, you're, you're held accountable. So I think that was, that was it. And he walked the walk, which was huge. So he was, he was a bouncer. He was a, a martial artist and, you know, won a lot of championships. So I think, you know, again, the, just like you guys do with, with go Ruck now, it was, it was a hard work element and, and getting comfortable being uncomfortable, which definitely factored into the fire service later on. So any, any, biggest lessons or, or lows, I mean, cause part of it is sure you have someone and you're lucky and fortunate in life if you find these people, right? A mentor or someone, and you look back, you know, like Karate Kid was all about this, you know? You're lucky if you find that person. The other part is you have to respond to it. What, was there any, any moments where either of that kind of got out of balance? Did you get unmotivated, super motivated? I mean, how did that endure? How did that work for you? Um, I think, honestly, the, the big thing for me was I got to the point where I was about to take my black belt test. And it was a lot of money, more money than I had at that moment. And so realizing the, the limitations, it wasn't, it wasn't bad. It wasn't um, a negative towards it. But when I first went to a boxing class and got my ass handed to me, I realized, okay, well, that one mentor, that one group is good, but you, you can become a big fish in a small pond. So then it was about looking for other ways to go back and be a white belt again, you know, get constantly humble, constantly humble. So taking all the, the things that, that that one, um, school had given me, but, and then, you know, as Bruce Lee said, absorb what's useful, discard what's useless, you know? So then you, you, you're at a, you're at a crossroads. You can either be the, the Cobra Kai of your, your school, or you can, can you know, again, go to jujitsu or, boxing, whatever it is, and realize that what you've learned is a small part, but this, there's this perpetual chase for growth. And I think that was what it was. It, everything I took from Taekwondo was amazing, but 
once I went to the next place and constantly got humbled, then I realized, okay, martial arts is a, it's for your entire life. It's not black belt. And then you, you know, you're done. And then looking back now, the black belt, I still would have got my ass kicked from most people. So, so yeah, I mean, I think that's a takeaway from that initial journey, but it did empower me that if you put the work in, you literally can achieve anything. So from that kind of uh, slightly scared farm boy, it, that was the first step to, to realizing, because I don't think I could have been a firefighter at 18 years old. I don't think I had the tools. So it took me my formative years to really build up to the point where I would have been a good candidate. All right. So let's talk about the shield. What's the shield? When I, it was circling back to what I wanted to do when I was a kid. And I think, honestly, I spent 10 years just fumbling around trying to trying to find something else. And when you've got that burning desire, there is nothing else. That's what you're supposed to do on this planet. So when I got to America, there was a, a fire academy right down the road. And the journey I took with the shield was I was working um, a like an office job, doing the fire school at night, went through that, finally got hired. What office job were you doing? Uh, I was working for a, a publishing company. So they actually did all the journals for the medical journals and that kind of thing. So it was actually, it wasn't bad. It was a kind of online customer service type thing, but I would literally, you know, get there early, get there at seven, start my work day, go to the YMCA workout, go till three then go back, change, go to the fire academy there till, you know, nine, 10 at night, rinse and repeat. So it was, I didn't have the option to go full time. You know, I had to pay the bills. So, um, but it was the most amazing thing. I never slept so well in my life as <laughs> after the tower. Um, and then my first apartment, I found myself in the Miami area down in um, Hialeah. So that was the first one, um, which was, you know, the the training for that was a crucible, absolute crucible. They they had a whole bunch of us that they hired what they call non cert So they we were all off the street, but about half of us actually had the fire academy and the EMT. So while the other civilians went through all that training, they basically beat us up for three months straight on the, the, the drill ground. So I think that was another huge thing formatively. I don't think classes before that got that or since, but we were lucky slash unlucky that, um, you know, we got to experience that. So that, that really set the bar extremely high for, for the rest of my career too. So a lot of people think that with the military, you just show up and they just let you in, like go to war or go to jail. And I've heard a lot of stories over the years. People think that's the same with the fire department. It's like, oh, you just show up. And if you want to join the fire department, you join the fire department. And that's not once I, I've met several people who, you know, for various stages in their careers, they couldn't get in or they, they didn't persevere along that path. They found a different path. I mean, so to go back a step, was, was that a challenge getting in or was it, I mean, cause you, you detailed a lot of the training. I've never really gone in depth into what a lot of the training is until I read your book. And now you're here. So I just, I want to understand more of sort of the process. Yeah. I think it, it depends where in the country you live or which country you live and also what time period. So I was very lucky when I was there, I would say that the, the uh, employment was pretty good. Now it's not easy to get in. You have like the Northeast and New York's where, I mean, you'll hear of guys, you know, bending over backwards, trying to get Hire because they're they're being trained by that department, so they're all civilians. So some of them will become police officers or even work for the um, trash department. So they're a city of, um, employee, and then they have a higher chance of getting in. So that's very very competitive. The environment I was around here in Florida and in California, um, it was competitive for a different reason because you could actually train yourself. So you could go to fire school, you could go to EMT school, you go to medic school, you could volunteer, you could ride ambulances on the side. So especially in California, these, these men and women I tested alongside, you know, they had a, a resume to get a position. So it's definitely not a profession where, you know, go to jail, join the fire service. You know, you, you have to really, really want to do it in most places. Um, but saying that, what was funny is when I came out of fire school and I said I was going to Miami, a lot of the people in you know, where I was in school were rolling their eyes saying, oh, you'll never, you'll never get hired down there unless you're a paramedic and you speak Spanish. Well, about three months later, I was working as a non-Spanish speaking EMT because you don't listen to people <laughs> when they tell you you can't do something. So I think you'll also see, you know, the, there's a lot of people lining up telling you that you can't do it. But if you have a burning desire to join the fire service, it's not like incredibly hard. I mean, I'm sitting obviously amongst some pretty 
high level members of the army right now. Um, you know, it, it's not up there, but it's definitely something that you have to train for, that you have to study for, and it should be. And that's one of the things that I talk about a lot on the podcast and the book is our bar needs to be pushed back up to to your guys, you know, because we're, you know, the tones go off and lives depend on us. So some of our bars we've seen the last 10 or so years have started to come down with the the myth that that will help with recruiting. But what it actually does is just lower the standard in the profession. So what's the, uh, you know, to someone out there, it's like, I, I want to consider the fire service, right? I mean, describe these crucible style events that happen in your training. And then, and then what's the why, right? Cause you talk about some great cadre, some great instructors that, that you had as well. And you know, it sounds like military cadre that we had is like, they're going to mm -hmm. be hard on you, but there's a why. And those are the great ones. Yeah. I mean, I think take a lower quadrant police officer or firefighter. We've all seen them in, in the grocery store. They're, they're overweight now. We say they roll on scene. They, they look disgruntled. When you look at the drill ground, when you look at the grinder of a, of a fire academy, a police academy, most of us, there's a few that slip through the cracks, but most of us are all there for the same reason. And I think that I truly believe the burning desire that why is, is to help people. And I think what makes a good cadre, and there's a spectrum, um, Hialeah was a great, great cadre, is you've got to have an understanding that we're literally going to decide if someone lives or dies. You know, whether it's in the medicine side where you, you know, I've had this where you literally, am I going to call this person? Is it done? Are we going to stop CPR? Are we going to stop pushing meds? Um, or whether it's, you know, an extrication choice, whether it's, you know, whether do you ent enter a building? Is it is it viable? So I think the good cadre, their why is always just that. Like, you know, we're trusting you to go out there and make decisions that will save lives. But if we don't do our job, you might make decisions that will take lives. I mean, George Floyd's a perfect example. You know, I mean, yes, there were other factors into it, but ultimately that was a failure of that dynamic at that moment. So, you know, and then obviously there's many examples in fire and EMS, I'm just picking on law enforcement, but it's trying to avoid things like that. And, and that starts at the front door, it starts at the academy, and that's why that bar needs to be set high and we need to have an, an attrition process to get rid of our week the same way as your guys do. One, you mentioned it earlier on. One of the things I think about when I think about fire, uh, law enforcement, military, when you go into those professions and, and into a profession that is going to require a tremendous amount of physical and mental effort, martial arts comes to mind also because you learn quickly to push self down. You learn that humility. You were talking about being humbled and that, that just, that jumped out at me because one of the things you, you learn to do quickly is to submit yourself to the process. And that's for a lot of people, that's very, very hard to do to accept that they are going to submit themselves to this process and even listen to it because fire academies, police academies, the good ones, uh, and the military require you to do that. And then you come back and begin your learning process, the mentoring process, and then you move to a team because it's a team effort. The cadre that are teaching you and you are a team. And then as you go to an actual location to serve, now you're on another team. And that team depends on you as you depend on them for their lives, as well as in the fire profession, police profession too, the requirement is there for you to save other lives also and to make yourself subservient to their needs whenever possible so that you're serving them. Yeah. Like the, the piece from the book, you, know, you don't want to do it. You, you hope you can do it well uh, and you have to learn to do it well. But that the humility is what really strikes me. Well, I think as well, it's, it's it, when you walk through a fire academy or police academy, you should be humble because you don't know a damn thing. You know, so if you if you got an ego, then you probably just just turn around and leave again. Um, but I think then what they do a very good job of is forging you as a ch as a team as a chain. So then for me, once I left that academy and went into the real world, you understand that you're a link and you don't want to be the weakest link. You know, exactly. so that understanding that your training is important, that your fitness is important, that you know your knowledge of your medical protocols and the uh, 
you know, the the actual first you, the area that you serve, understanding the streets and the buildings and, you know, the if there's, is there a train going to come through at this time? Those are all little parts. And, and I'm not saying by any means that I succeeded, that I was a great firefighter, but that was always my my goal was to be better when I left the next day than I was the day before. And I think if you get an ego, if you think that you've got it now, you know, and, and now you're kind of telling war stories because you've got five years on to the new guy and, you know, then um, that's extremely dangerous because, you know, once you lose that humility, then you become uh, complacent and then you become a liability to the people you serve and the people you serve with. True. Where we are, it's sort of like, if you have zero fear of jumping out of an airplane, you better quit. Yeah. Because you're going to do something stupid and dangerous for yourself and for others. Yeah. Or <laughs> zero fear getting in the stack to go into the house. I mean, if, if that doesn't, if there's not a pucker factor in your life, and you're doing something that's that dangerous, it's, it's just going to lead to bad outcomes. You know, someone said to me, just to interject, because you just reminded me, if you've had people that you've worked with that normally aren't like that, and you, they start becoming like that, and, you know, and, and in some circles they're viewed, oh, he's such a hero, he ran into, you know, to a hail of gunfire or into a burning building. More recently, as I've explored the whole mental health thing, that's also a huge red flag that one of your brothers and sisters is in crisis. Exactly. And that, that fear, yep. you know, that fear of death is now leaving them. So before we get into some of, because there's a lot of experience that you've gained on, on stuff like the role of trauma and health and PTSD and addiction and community and family and money and camaraderie and, and all, like there's, there's a lot that you've learned throughout your, your career. I, I want to start out though, with like what is a perfect day or a perfect week or what's the best part about the fire service? I think most people, if they're listening, the perfect day would be fires from the moment you get there until 10 p.m. and then sleep all night. But that never happens. <laughs> but no, I think, you know, that we have a kind of saying where we don't wish ill on anyone. But if someone's going to have their worst day, we want to be the crew that responds. And I think that's it. So whatever saving a life looks like, the beautiful thing about the fire service is we're a Swiss army knife, you know, jack of all trades, master of none. And we really are master of none because we have so many skills to, to try and stay proficient on. We're never, ever going to call ourselves a master. You know, you have the guy that's better with ropes or, you know, the, the, the one that's great with, you know, cardiology, but, but we're all kind of <laughs> treading water with the ducks, you know, underneath our feet are, are pedaling furiously. Um, but yeah, so I think a lot of us, you know, there'd be, the medical calls where we're able to save a life, you know, there would be the cardiac arrest or the asthma attack and you push the right meds and they come back the extrication that goes well, where, you know, you're able to cut someone out of a car and save their life, you know, it might be a rope rescue or a, a fire, but the perfect day for us is when we truly are able to do our job where, where you drive home. And I've had this a lot where you made a difference in the world. You made the, the world minutely better. So what, pushes against that a lot of the time, some departments is actually you know, organizational, you know, they're not allowed to do what they're trained to do. You know, there's a lot of micromanaging. And then there is actually a lot of uh, 911 abuse as well. So we want to be out there saving lives. And if we're not saving lives, the proficient, you know, aggressive departments want to be training, whether it's fitness training, whether it's actual skills training. Um, but there's a lot of superfluous calls that really emergencies shouldn't be going on. So, you know, the, uh, the perfect day would be all life-saving interventions and none of the, you know, the fire alarms that are nothing and the person with three cars in their driveway that called for a ride to the ambulance, you know, the, the, the things that, I mean, it really is 911 abuse. So for us to, to have positively influenced the world in some positive way, and these, even like I talk about in the book, it doesn't have to be a life-saving thing. It can be a compassionate thing, like the, the elderly person that fell out of bed and their partner can't get them in. You know, and you clean them up. World War II veteran, right? Yes, exactly. And that's, again, I mean, every responder listening knows exactly what I'm talking about. And it's a back to bed call, but that's giving someone their dignity back. So whether you're restarting their heart or just giving them a fresh, uh, cleaning them up and putting clean clothes on them, it's the same thing. You've made it better. So a shift full of those and then getting some sleep would be nice. Then, yeah, that'd be, <laughs> that'd be the perfect shift. Okay. And so how does the, how does the camaraderie work at the firehouse then? Right. Cause that, that's gotta be a big part of it. I mean, it's not just 
running into burning buildings or whatever the public service deed of the day is, because there is downtime. And for us, it come, always comes back to the team room, you know, and what's it like with those other guys that are there. And it's just nonstop banter back and forth. I mean, den of wolves, you know? And, and so what's it like, you know, you got the cool fire pole and you got the, the dinner table and people are eating, you know, it's like family style. Like these are all my preconceptions, whatever, from watching Ghostbusters as a kid, you know? So <laughs> forgive me all of those, but it, it did uh, very positively impact my, my view of firefighters at a very young age. But what's it, what's it really like? Yeah, so in a, in a cohesive crew, one that's, you know, that's trained hard together, it's exactly like, it's brutal. Like we had um, this thing called the wall of shame where, you know, I'd go out and maybe I'd make a mistake on the call and I'd come back and my face is photoshopped and all these cartoons where they're making the same mistake. But yeah, the, when we are own, but in, in a positive way, there's no malice behind it, but it is absolutely brutal. But the way you forge that as well is also what you do with GORUCK. You know, we, we, we suffer together. So the fire service in a dining room table is, is amazing, but another place is a tailboard. So if we've had a good fire, especially if you've really made a difference, you save some units of an apartment complex, or you actually, you know, stopped a house fire and save someone's possessions, maybe their photo album. Um, it, it feels amazing. So when you're loading hose, that's another place where there's a lot of jokes, but just that, that true feeling of brotherhood and sisterhood. But I think that suffering is very, very important. If, if you don't have that suffering, if you don't have that academy at the beginning or that orientation where you go through that crucible, you don't build those bonds as much. And then you add in now, you know, the, the cell phones are distraction. A good thing in the fire services are actually dividing up the dorms now. So a whole room full doesn't wake up for one you know, vehicle's call. But that can be bad as far as community as well. But your vision is exactly what it should like. And it's, it's very healing from a mental health point of view. If we just run on something horrific... And then we come back and banter and eat together and, you know, hopefully we'll talk about it. But even if we're not specifically talking about that, we're, we're having community, we're having conversation, we're offloading, you know, our emotions. It's a, it's a very, very powerful place. So that's, that's why I think it's so important that we do. And it's heartbreaking because one of the guys I spoke to recently said, because of COVID, they're not allowed to eat around a dinner table at the moment, which is insanity. I mean, they sleep together, they're on the rig together. Breaking bread is is not going to cause a, <laughs> an outbreak of COVID in in the community. So, yeah, that you're absolutely right. That's that's the nucleus of a fire station is the kitchen table. So to go back to the the original story, you're there, the jaws of life. It goes really bad from there, right? And you you can go into any detail or or really top level, but how do you how do you process an, an event like that? See, it's interesting. That particular one, I, I, they're all real events, but they're fictionalized. So there are things that have changed because the worst thing in the world would be that a member from that story reads it one day. So it's a kind of mishmash of, of real events. But the inability to save is crushing. Um, you, you do the scenarios in the fire academy and you, know, you, you save the mannequin, you pull the baby out and then and that's it. You know, it's over and good job. And you do your stuff in paramedic school. Okay, I push these meds, I, you know, cardio, I do whatever. And congratulations, you saved them. The reality is a lot of the stuff that we do, we could do perfectly, the person still dies. So obviously when you pull someone out and it's successful in extrication or, you know, an event like that, it's great. It's a celebration. It feels good. But there, there really is, uh, you know, a, 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 a cumulative weight of people that you didn't save. And I think that's, again, you know, why the training is so important. And again, something that you guys both talk about a lot. But if you have trained diligently and you still lose people, I think that's a softer blow than if you know in your heart of hearts that you didn't train and that person died. And now you start questioning if you could have saved them. So that's what I've kind of always lent into is if I've taken every single shift and every single day to make myself a little bit better. And again, I'm not saying I was perfect by any means, but you're always pushing that needle of improvement. God forbid something happens, you can lean back into, well, I tried everything I could, you know, up to that point, I made myself as good as I could, you know, we did everything that we were taught. But it, it adds up, you know, and the proverbial bucket does, does get filled. And if you're not offloading it, then, you know, at some point, it reaches critical mass. So 
it's very, very important that you understand every one of those calls, even if it didn't affect you at that moment in time, it's still a little chip with that hammer. So in this specific story, right? I mean, there's a, there's a little girl whose life you save, and, and yet both of her parents don't make it. And you've got the the driver, vehicular homicide, whatever you, whatever you want to call it, right? Who's sort of, you know, playing the I wish I wouldn't have game that you don't get a take back from. And I guess what I'm getting at is at a more, you relate it back to your your son, which made it very visceral for me as it would for, for any parent. And it, and it also reminded me of you know, the last person that we had in here was, was Roger Sparks, who is a PJ. So did a lot of the same, a lot of the same stuff, but did in Afghanistan and in Alaska. And, you know, he viewed it as he had, he had to do CPR on his son when his son was an infant and Roger's back was broken. And I mean, it was at the time, like 30 minutes of, it, it was just, it, it's almost hard for me to talk about it, right? It's it's so excruciating, and yet he he's doing hero, heroic work with his son, which is which is great. The compensation that he's made is that he's like, look, when I'm going out there, I'm going out there, and I'm I'm seeing Oz, my son's face, as I'm trying to save these people, and you know, it's they're they're there. He doesn't know them, but there's this human element to all of this that binds us together, and. I, I would imagine that, because I know there are in the military, and I know how much how much there is in common when you deal with things like this. It's it's really hard, is is what I'm getting at. These things, and we're all human. And there's a lot of people out there that will kind of push these things aside and wish they were tougher, and they won't let it kind of seep in. Like, what did do, what does it look like if it's not this case, or if it's another case? Like, what does it look like for you with a ton of experience going through this? Like, what does rock bottom look like? How, how do you kind of leverage the support structures that you have to kind of come back up and, and put the suit on th the next day or the next time? I think rock bottom sneaks up on people. And that's the problem. You know, the, the, there's so many elements. Um, it's funny because what he was saying about seeing his son in the patients, I, I think I have the opposite effect where we just go into a flow state. So I'm not thinking... You know, some of us probably seem kind of callous even when we're when we're working, but you're absolutely focused. You're in that that moment. So you're not to me, I'm not thinking about the human. I'm being compassionate, but I have a job to do. Probably the same as, as in a firefight. You know, you, you, you're just focused on the task at hand and not realizing that around you, you almost got shot <laughs> in all these different ways. Um, so as, as far as rock bottom, I think what I've seen from all the people I've had on the show is it it really does creep up and people slowly they lean into to a, a variety of coping mechanisms that then compound the effect so to start on a positive note what it, what a a healthy coping mechanism would be is that we see this and i've got you know i kind of was like this myself even though we're doing what we do there's an understanding that the shifts beat us down. So whether you're police or fire or, or doctors or nurses or corrections, understanding that that sleep is completely detrimental to physical health, to mental health. So that's going to play a part. So don't be the guy that saves all their um, vacation time. Don't, they're not going to give you a medal for it. You know, use your time off. If you start taking all, you know, more overtime, anything that seems like you're trying to busy your mind, that's a big you know, warning sign. Alcohol is huge in a lot of our professions and we lean into that. So the problem is it's, it's that Chinese water torture is very, very gradual, but the bottom, what it looks like is a lot of the people I've had on my podcast, which is literally sitting there with a gun in their mouth. That's, that's rock, rock bottom. A lot of them get close, but I think one of the, the best people to ask if you're descending is, is your loved ones because you're not going to see it yourself but your family are going to see it, your kids and your wife. And I mean, we, we, I think police and fire have lost more people. I think this year COVID has been a, a big one, but again, I don't know if that's pure COVID or the unusual statistics we're seeing, but usually uh, suicide is killing more than line of duty deaths. So that, you know, line of duty for us is fires and crashes and all those things. So yeah, I mean, we have a, we have a spectrum of, of low. Luckily my low was never, deep, but I, I mean, probably a quarter of the men and women I had on my show either were about to take their own life 
and then something stopped it or a few of them actually did and either they survived their injuries or they survived the fall or the gun didn't go off but it's a very very real thing that that trauma in itself has a weight but another big thing that people don't talk about is what do we bring into the profession our professions associated attract men and women that were abused you know had a tr some sort of traumatic childhood because they don't they want that cycle to stop they want to be the protector so i don't think a lot of attention is given especially in first responder professions to who that human being is that holistic whole human before as you mentioned the shield goes on our chest and that seems to be a contributing factor to if someone deals with that low successfully or if you know if they end up succumbing to to suicide so it's not complicated but there are a, a variety of factors that all play in and can create that perfect storm that sadly you know takes veterans and police officers and firefighters and civilians every single day so sort of taking suicide uh, re removing that right just as a cuz it is it's to me it's not an either or thing it's not like either you've really contemplated suicide or, or you haven't and you know I I never got there, but I've, I've hit some lows, right? Like what gets to you the most or what has gotten to you the most? I mean, I, I sense just a ton of compassion in you and you talk a lot about how you've never been able to bring someone back from cardiac arrest, right? Well, implication is you've done that a lot, right? And, and have been unable to do that. And I sensed a lot from your writings that you wanted to, you wanted to share what you could about your, your, failures, what you got right, how, how we as a people can do it all better. But I sense like some really raw nerve endings with, with a lot of this stuff. Like it, it's, it gets to you. Yeah. No, I, th I think it's that inability to save I talked about. I mean, that I, I touched on that. I never had a cardiac arrest save. Like God forbid you, I'm your medic. When, when the ambulance shows up, you're screwed because <laughs> I just didn't. And we did everything right, but I'd have the the brain bleeds that have the, um, you know, what they call the GI bleed. So just these kind of disease processes that you just don't get people back, triple A's. And that definitely weighs. But where, I think where the raw ending, what raw nerve endings are, is that extends into society. So as when we, we rocked and we were talking today about the obesity element of the deaths we've had this year from COVID, like the fact that that message was suppressed fact that was heresy that you dare talk about underlying conditions in this is exactly what i'm talking about like we as as medics and doctors and nurses we see behind the curtain we see what's killing americans british you know whatever country we're in so whatever is being told to us by said leader we can see if that's bs or not because we know who's walking into the er or being rolled into the er so the inability to save is my frustration, of course, with, with the people I lost as a medic or a firefighter. It's the frustration with the needless death of my colleagues. You know, that I mentioned about, um, you know, two years, I had six people that we buried to the point where I hate bagpipes now with a passion because they just take me back to the church. And then, you know, with, with the driving element, you know, with all this needless death because someone was too selfish and they cut through a gas station because they didn't want to go through a red light and killed a kid or, you know, whatever it was. So it's, it's when you know that deaths were preventable and someone still died. That's the raw nerve to me. But does it make, does that, does that make it hard to get up in the morning? No, it makes me, more, you know, gives me energy to get up because, you know, people say about being an incurable optimist. I mean, that's what I am. Like, I know we can change because it's not hard. I'll give you a perfect example. One of the things that is my, um, the, the dead horse that I flog a lot is drug prohibition. If you look at the history of that, it immediately followed alcohol prohibition, which no one will argue was a complete disaster. You know, we empowered criminals with you know, death of Americans back then. So that was founded on the back end of that. There was part job trust justification. There was a big racial you know, racist element to why that started. And it's, become you know, an epic failure. And I see as a medic, the kids that are killed in these gang shootings, the overdoses, the, you know, all these things, you know, the prisons have just expanded and expanded and expanded. So all it takes is to mirror 
Switzerland, Portugal, some of these countries that have done it, there's an easy fix. So I'm optimistic that one day there'll be a critical mass if we educate enough people where we'll change that. And there seems to be a sway towards that. But, you know, you want to, you want to make the streets safer for police and the civilians, then you take away the drug. Element. Imagine if there was no drug-related crime, that every, every addict now was a, a patient, a medical patient. You cut the head off the snake, even to the point with the war on terror. I've had you know guests that are talking about how that funds you know Al Qaeda and some of these groups too. So there are so many things I know we can fix. You know whether it's the way we farm, you know what we do with our food and our animals and everything. That it's just a case of getting people educated and angry, as I say, to the point where we force change. Because right now, you know, people are, are dying needlessly, and it's basically you know power of money that's behind it. I'd like to circle back to something you were talking about before. Please. And, and that is that as an individual in a critical profession, let's call it that. Uh, it could be fire, it could be police, it could be military. And as you're preparing for that, as you're, as you're starting to develop yourself through the academy, through the various trainings at, at units when you go to them, the, the actual installations, I'm interested, did, did, at any time do you remember mentors because this worked for me, that the mentors you had, that the instructors or cadre or whoever it was, did they try in any way to prepare you for the bad times to come, for the times when you're going to do everything you can within your reason to save a patient and you can't? No. Or <laughs> is the short answer. Okay. Yeah. Because I mean, that, that, that was something that happened to me as I was going through through special forces training. There were a lot of old guys there. And, and I kind of looked askance at them a little bit, but these were guys that had been in some of them in world war II. I caught a few of those guys, Korea, some that had already been to Vietnam prior to my going. And they knew what I was going to be seeing. They knew what I was going to be involved in. And they, they, they didn't do a perfect job, but they tried to prepare me for those mental issues, because you're right. You're absolutely correct. It isn't just one great big event and all of a sudden you've got a, a problem. It builds over a period of time. It fills the bucket up and then finally the bucket's overflowing and then you've got a problem on your hands. And you need to get it fixed. And those guys, that helped me immensely. And I was just wondering if you ever ran into that in any of your training or preparation. Yeah, I see. I think when I came into the fire service, there's no disrespect to any of them. I just don't think yeah. that was a conversation that was being had at that time. I mean, honestly, I would say if you ask most people in the fire service, it's been the last six years or so where we've really, you know, a lot of us been talking about it. There have been some pioneers like way before I was ever talking about it and kudos to them. They were the real visionaries. But I think prior to that, it was, and I point to this, it was the, it was the Hollywood version of a man you know suck it up buttercup rub some dirt in it you know boys don't cry and it's crazy because of the perfect illustration of how ridiculous that is as you look at the show band of brothers dick winters and some of those guys talking at the end the real real men and they're in tears and this is 60 plus years later some of the most heroic soldiers that ever walked the face of the earth so if they can cry and talk about their feelings why can't uh you know, one year probationary firefighter, you know? So what's great though, just to kind of soak around to your point is some of the people that were my mentors in the fire service. So I just um, worked with a friend of mine who was one of my instructors in the academy. And now we became good friends. And then some of the guys in my very first fire department, Hialeah, they're all part of that conversation now. So it's kind of gone full circle where, you know, when I started this, they they listen to the podcast now and we, and we talk. So they didn't have that conversation then, but it's definitely a movement now to change that. And I think that that's the next step. And then it goes back to humility, like you said, just because we did it one way before, you know, same way as I talk about the way we were taught to exercise, you know, the yeah. old bodybuilding machine doesn't work for firefighters, you know, right. so we have to have the humility to go, okay, this part was good, but we're going to discard this part and we need to, we need to change. So um, no, it wasn't given to us, but I really hope that the young men and women entering the fire service now are being given those tools. Great. All right. So circling back to some of the, the, the big issues, you're, you're sort of touching on them. And we certainly don't have the next uh, 
six days to sit here nonstop and talk about all of them ad, ad nauseum. But, but in essence, you know, you go into a lot of the, the cost of service, right? Whether it's Agent Orange and Vietnam or whether it's, you know, the carcinogens that are a part of your coughing up a bunch of black stuff after you're, you, you come out of a burning house, right? What I sense is, is you also, you're, you're looking at like a holistic approach to a person's life tied to a community. I mean, Firehouse, to me, that's kind of center of a community, right? I mean, you've got these, you've got these ideas of how we should farm better food, how we should eat better food that doesn't have chemicals in it. So we'll have lower cancer rates. We should pay our public servants more. We should train them more, right? The rest of America should sacrifice more so that we can more greatly reward and take care of those who are, who are serving, right? We need to increase the standards of people who are in public service. We need to make it easier for those who are serving to get proper rest because everybody, now I know with your story, because the military, it's always just stay up and get it done. You don't need sleep, right? You know, because because you're tough and these things are, <laughs> have gone, you know, it's like you can't, you can't wear your heart on your sleeve 24 seven, but it, it's okay to get some sleep, like real natural sleep. You know, you, you talk a lot about, you know, a head full of sort of broken glass almost, like the effects of trauma and just, you know, PTSD at, at being so close and intimate with, with loss of human life and like always being, always being the one that people call when they're at their worst. You also talk about the good of the fire service, the camaraderie. And we, we got a little bit longer, like what's the big push? Like, why are you doing all this? What, like, what's your goals now? Because you've, you've got a really... You've got a, a large platform with, with the podcast. You, you seem super high energy and super engaged into all of these things. And you seem really wanting to, to educate more people, to put out more positive stuff on, on your terms and your way with your experience, which I, I mean, I respect, we respect yeah. immensely. What's the goal? I mean, again, it, it's the same mission as when I stood on that drill ground terrified the first day standing on a diamond getting screamed at um it's to make a difference you know and i think it's not not just saving lives but improving quality of life i mean you look at the the statistics that you know we in america live a certain age but what's the quality of life of that age you know so i think we're so lucky in the fire service to do what we do i mean i'm living the dream you know i got to do everything i got to be a stuntman i even got to be a pirate that's a whole different story um, <laughs> but you know, so we're so fortunate to do this job, but another thing that goes alongside this job is you get this completely different perspective of the world, the same way as you guys do. I mean, you've seen things that the rest of us will never have any idea, you know, what happened and what, what the people of that country were going through and, you know, what the, you know, the, the impact of your presence positively on that community. And so we see the men and women in this country being told one thing and that having a ripple effect to taking away quality from their life, whether it's a shortened lifespan, whether it's illness, whether it's, you know, again, the, the, the effects of um, our driving standards and seeing the death and on the roads. So the mission is the same. It's, it's to save lives, but transitioning from the fire service, because I realized that when you work for a department, your hands are tied, the same as the military. Like my best military guests have retired from the military because then they can, and it's not about, you know, talking negatively. You can just speak freely. You know, you don't have to worry about anything. So the mission is the same though. You know, I, it's just now I get to do it with all these people, these experts coming on and trying to educate people. They, if you believe the infomercials and the news stations with the segments into four people arguing with each other on Fox or CNN or whatever, you know, you're not going to learn anything. You're just going to be scared. So the goal is to educate people that there are answers to so many of our problems, you know, and you know, for example, like we talked on the beach, your obesity might be nothing to do with the food. It might be actually something to do with your mental health, something you went through when you were younger. You're subconsciously putting on the weight because just to, to pull an example from one of my guests, there was a woman in the study who they found out was sexually abused. So it was an obesity study. Well, it turns out subconsciously she didn't want to be slim and pretty because when she was slim and pretty, she was preyed upon. You know, so there's just all these different elements 
that and these, these tools that people can have to own their health, to own their safety. And I think we've, you know, the, the military have done a great job. Some of you guys that are retired and had platforms like Go Ruck or, you know, Jocko or Sons of a Flag or whatever, and used your platform. Well, there, there aren't really many firefighters that you can say, oh, you know, I, so-and-so has this thing. You know, we don't, we just kind of retire and, you know, go to the villages or wherever, <laughs> whatever community. So it's such a waste of a, a career if we just retire and that's it. So I wanted to take the lens of the responder and use that to educate the general public on how they can empower themselves, how they can improve their health, you know, how the medicines that a doctor tells them of a chronic disease isn't going to save their life. Because as you read in the book, the number of cardiac arrests we have where they handed us, a, I mean, I'm not joking, a, a grocery bag full of pill bottles. Well, that didn't save the person, but your doctor told you it would help keep you healthy. You know, so it's kind of breaking those myths and just getting people to question what they've been taught and hopefully empowering them to realize that, you know, a, a slip disc doesn't mean pills and surgery. That You can rehab that through exercise, you know. I mean, there's just all these solutions that will make people's lives better. So that was that was it. The mission's the same, just the uniform's different. So you you really deal with kind of political solutions, policy stuff, right? You deal with business solutions, you know, big pharma, et cetera, big business problems in is, is more what you detail. And then you also talk a lot about personal responsibility. W which occupies the most of your your time? You see that that's a great question because both it's, it's, you cannot have the conversation without bringing them both into it. Let's take the obese person. You know, you'll get the victim mentality like, oh, it's because there's fast food everywhere. Yes, that's, a, that's true. But then you'll get the, oh, they're fat because they just eat too much. Well, that's also true. But if you bring both of those into the conversation, you're like, well, so you want this person to have ownership over what they eat. Well, then let's create an environment in that, let's say, town where they're surrounded by healthy food and opportunities to exercise you know and obviously we've seen the polar opposite as last year where the chick-fil-a's are open and all the gyms are closed so that's take 2020 and reverse it that's what we should be seeing so yes there's ownership and that top 10 percent is going to be fit and healthy regardless of how crap the environment is but that middle portion you can really push the needle so say our children have you know, the same food they would have been served 80 years ago before all the industrial farming came in. So they had real vegetables, real fruit, you know, all, all these, these healthy meals. And that's what they knew from kindergarten through to 18 years old. The chances of them being obese are far, far less. But then there's going to be some heavy kids in that group. But if you create an environment of health and then you promote ownership as well and get rid of the victim mentality, those two side by side in the same conversation, I think is how we, we make change. Over generations. You're not, you're not talking about silver bullets here. No. I mean, you can't solve these problems with silver bullets. It's not possible. No, but you could, but you vote with your dollar too. So that's the thing. So my thing isn't about, when we said about policy change, it's not about going to the politicians, not a fan personally. It's about empowering the masses because look at, look at your publics these days, the organic and healthy areas are getting more and more populated and that's because of people that's because of influence look at smoking you know you don't smell smoke in a restaurant anymore that's because of people and obviously some of the you know the anti-smoking lobbies but that's people angry and fired up who've probably left and they lost loved ones that said enough is enough so i think you know we're not looking for a, a silver bullet like you said it's not overnight success but the more people that are empowered you know, the faster we affect change it doesn't have to be a race but if we improve every day, our grandkids are going to look back and just read in the history books about how, you know, there was a point where children were dying before their parents, which is just unacceptable. Well, I think that's a great point because it's, it's all about making people aware of their choices. You can't force anybody to make a choice. They have to want to make it themselves. So you need to make them aware of the options that they have to live a healthier life, to live a... a a more well life. And I've seen some turnarounds recently that I, I, I kind of like. I, I think back, you, you mentioned about 
kids 80 years ago. Well, you're getting really close. (laughs) (laughs) But I I think back to it, and I I think about when I was a kid and and I was going through school, and uh, the food that we ate was all pretty much localized food. Uh, It came from local farms, local dairies, whatever. And I can remember when I was a kid, I'd always take a nickel to school so I could have a little a little carton of milk in, in the afternoon. And I'm not here to advocate milk. Everybody gets lactose intolerant and everything else. But I drank that milk. I've got pretty decent bones. Now, I, I can't say that exactly that milk made me a stronger, better person. But I don't think it hurt me either. And people really, they went back to their roots. And then along came fast food and everything else, a a, a different lifestyle, a more sedentary lifestyle, because people back then walked a lot more than they do now. And that's why it's so great to be involved with a company like GoRuck, because we can make people walk again, get them out there and just doing something. I don't care if if they're carrying 45 pounds. I don't care if they're carrying 10 pounds. Just get out and walk and then make yourself better, make yourself healthier make people aware. And I think that's one of the things that GORUCK is all about. I think that's what I'm hearing you say is make people aware so that they make better choices, so that they don't just take the choices that are presented to them on the the boxed news shows, but they're really aware of what's going on around them and what they're doing to themselves. I think about the the smoking thing too, because I was a smoker at one point in time. I think everybody in America probably was at one point in time. There's been times when it's been touted as a health of, uh, plus mm-hmm. to smoke way early on, but so was cocaine. So, you know, you just, you have to take it all with a, you have to get smart. You have to make yourself aware. You have to make yourself understand what's going on around you. It, it's great to see restaurants where there's no smoking, but it's taken a long time to do that. And I go back to Jason's comment and and yours there are no silver bullets. Nothing happens overnight. There's no magic to it. It's a slow process, but it's an important process. And it's one that I'm glad to see you taking. I'm glad to see GORUCK taking the angle that it is from, from the health aspect and the wellness and the exercise and getting outdoors. That's the way America should be headed. And I hope slowly but surely that course change takes effect. Yeah. Well, just to interject because i agree 100 percent. to give you an example mike my my friend from uh our gym crossfit iron legion mike oliveros he has been super invested in, in what you guys are doing and you know participating in all the rucks well his influence ended up getting our founder to start a ruck club whilst our gym was closed in ocala so when we had that big old lockdown and that goes again about that environment to to thrive because you created this, because, you know, rucking was obviously well known in the military, but in the civilian population, you don't just think, oh, I'm going to go throw a backpack on and walk for a while. That was the option for us. And and while we were closed, those guys were rucking every morning, 6 a.m. So early enough where you didn't get any bitching about people being too close to each other. Obviously, you're outside as the sun comes up, you've got sunshine, you've got fresh air and nature. So everything that we know that improves resilience against COVID and everything else that's trying to you know, infiltrate the human body, they were doing through that. But it's you guys who created that environment. And that's exactly what I'm saying. The Tough Mudders, the Spartans, the Go Rucks, the CrossFits, all these movements that we've seen. And then you take you know, the organic farming and all that stuff, all those movements, those are all collectively pushing the needle and starting to get the outliers, the people, you know, the people that were were on the fence. Now they've been enveloped by all these organizations, now they're healthier. And it's just about pushing that fence. So it's not, as you said, an overnight thing, but I think it's kind of like Newton's laws of motion. The hardest is getting from zero to moving. Then as you start getting that moving, you, you start to build up speed. So I'm I'm super excited. I think, you know, the all these things that I'm seeing, and I've, I've touched on, on mud runs even in the book, like that is the solution. You know, the healthy eating, the exercise, the community that's built within CrossFit gyms, Spartan races, rucks, go ruck events. That is exactly what we need. So I hope that the bow is being drawn back. And when we let go, it's companies like yours that everyone's, you know, turning to because that is what we need to change health. And if 
all this COVID stuff, we're, we're actually truly valuing health, then we need to be all in on everything that promotes health. So I'm proud to fight the good fight with you on this. Um, so this podcast is called Glorious Professionals. Glorious amateurs were the members of the OSS, right? They volunteered to serve the cause, defeat the Nazis, right? Stood on the right side of history. The, the quiet professionals, that's, that's our roots in, in special forces, right? You know, this, this idea of, of send me. Wherever my country needs me, send me. And so our goal here is educate, inform, and, and ultimately give back, right? We've, we've been fortunate. We're, we're fortunate to be vertical, not horizontal. We're fortunate to have been through a lot of experiences. And we, we just want, we believe in this way of life, right? Like this is the hill we'll die on this way of life. And, and I think more people will get more out of life if they live with a little bit of this kind of special forces mindset, way of life, which, is, which you also very much embody. And it's, it's an honor to chat with you. The last question is sort of what's your advice to, to the next generation of firefighters, of Americans, of citizens of the world? T take your pick. Yeah, I would say learn from Learn from our mistakes, this generation right now, and not like we've done everything wrong because we haven't at all. But the things that we're saying, uh, in hindsight, that was wrong. Pick up from there and then do it right. So whether it's, like I said, you get a bunch of young firefighters now, get out there and do the functional training, you know, whether it's a strongman stuff, CrossFit, CrossFit base, obviously, especially if you're training for, you know, selection, you better get a, pa a pack on your back and start rucking. But yeah, I mean, as I said, absorb what is useful, discard what is useless. So all the kind of stigma that our generation had around mental health up till a few years ago, burn it. <laughs> you know, this is where we're trying to tell you now is zero. So make mental health absolutely a part of overall health, not just, you know, dealing with trauma, but performance. You know, the more resilient you are, the more you process everything you've been through, the more resilient you are as a soldier, a firefighter, a cop. And then the same with the you know, the physical health, you know, um, understand that you heal your body through food, not medicine. Medicine is amazing and trauma medicine, um, you know, there's, there's emergency medicine, absolutely. But, you know, the body and homeostasis is the most incredible thing that's lasted hundreds of thousands of years. So I would say learn from this generation's mistakes, really learn what our great grandparents did because there's a lot of good there. And then take the innovation, all the good things that we've done up to this generation, add that in, and that's going to be a force multiplier for, for you thriving in the next generation. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for coming on. Thank you so much for having me. It's been my honor. Oh, real quick then, all the, the social stuff. Okay. Um, so the book, One More Light, uh, Life, Death, and Humanity Through the Eyes of a Firefighter. I always have problems remembering the title. I, you um, just asked me to read it next time. It's sitting right here. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you can get that on Amazon. It's actually an audible now. I did the audio book. Um, funny story. Josh Brolin did the, the forward and he reads. Of Goonies fame. Yes. I know he did other stuff, but nobody really cares about the other stuff compared <laughs> to Goonies. Okay, continue. So he read the forward on the audio book too. So you'll have one chapter with one of the best voices in Hollywood and then my squeaky English voice will read the rest <laughs> of it. Um, and then I'm on all other socials, but honestly, Instagram's the best one for me. So it's uh, behind the shield nine one one, and I'm you know I read all my messages, so love interacting. As long as you're a you know nice person, respectful to the other people in the community, then uh, we'd love to have you on there. Awesome, thanks, man.